Okay, well, let's call our meeting to order. It's straight up noon. Um, Mr. Coley, looks like Don't all the commissioners are here. Uh, our uh, first order of business is to approve the um, minutes of our last meeting. Um, anybody have any additions or do I have a motion to approve? I move to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, our, um, on our agenda today is Resolution 1370, authorizing the transfer of KMB's right title and interest in real property along Clifton Road, Sanderson Road, and I don't know how to pronounce this street, <laughs> Chili, Chili Coffee Street to the city of Knoxville. Metha, would you? Yes. Uh, commissioners, there's some properties along uh, those roads. <laughs> and, uh, that have been uh, used in our electric system for many, many years. Uh, the lines have been really up, relocated, and we do not need all that property going forward. So let me recognize Julie Childers. She will tell you about the use of that property and what we intend to do with it, subject to your approval. Okay, maybe she will. Okay, as Ms. Roach mentioned, we do have nine parcels located on Clifton, Chillicothe, and Sanderson. This is where we used to have some uh, transmission lines that went down the middle of these properties. Julie, can you speak up? I've got sinus problems. Let me move up. It's like my ears are <laughs> clogged up. Okay. Uh, we used to have transmission lines that went through the middle of these properties, but they have been moved, and so we um, can declare these surplus. This map shows where we're talking about. Um, it's turned on its side, so north is to the left. Western Avenue is here. I-640 is off the page. There's a Hardee's right here on the corner, and our substation is directly south of uh, the Hardee's. The properties that we need to retain are the ones that have the substation on it, as well as uh, there are transmission lines that cross this diagonally. So the orange properties is what KEB needs to retain. The rest of these properties um, are uh, able to be declared surplus. We used to have uh, large H-frame towers that went down the middle of these properties that had the transmission lines on it. Now those have been relocated to the front of the properties on poles. A single line of poles goes down the front. And so all that we need to retain on the rest of those properties is just a 25-foot easement. So resolution 1370 declares these properties a surplus and reserving that 25-foot easement along the front and allows the president and CEO to transfer a portion of these properties to the city uh, for a public purpose. Are there any questions? So what are those properties known for right now? Those are known for residential. residential. So what's, do we know what the city wants them for? They've talked about a couple of different options, maybe some affordable housing, but yeah. we don't really know yet. That'd be good. It's a great little neighborhood. Yeah. Very nice. So it's been sitting there vacant, so it needs to be. All right. Any other questions? Um, we need a motion to approve resolution 1370 on first and final reading. So moved. Second. Um, is there anyone here from the public that would like to address us with regard to to this resolution? If not, Mr. Coley, would you please call the roll? Mr. Askew. Aye. Commissioner Hamilton. Aye. Commissioner Herbert. Aye. Commissioner Pinnell. Aye. Commissioner Small. Aye. Commissioner Thompson. Aye. Commissioner Warden. Aye. Resolution 1370 is passed. And I recognize Memphis for the President's report. Uh, commissioners, let me take you back several years and talk to you about our grid modernization project. You've heard a lot about our advanced meters that we're already installing. and. We're on time with that part of the project. But there was another piece of that that you all uh, had reviewed in your funding plans, and it was about distribution automation. And I'm going to introduce Andrew Himaleski. He's going to tell you about that and the technology advances that will come out of that work. You've already paid, funded this, so this is a project that we're now getting uh, ready to engage in, and it's really exciting for us. Andrew? Thank you, Ms. Roach. 
Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on distribution automation and telecom portions of grid modernization. Grid modernization goes back to 2008 with a business case for advanced meters. And in 2009, we applied for a grant issued by the Department of Energy, which was later awarded. 2010, we be began installing advanced meters in a pilot area near UT Fort Sanders and began collecting results. We met the terms of the, of the grant in 2014, and we developed a more in-depth, full-scale business case. As, as Ms. Roach uh, said earlier, the board approved those funding in 2015. So, grid modernization has two main focuses. Meter modernization, which is a four-year plan that is focused on the installation of around 400,000 advanced meters. Today, I'm gonna to focus on distribution automation. It is focused on the modernization of the communication networks as well as distribution system devices. There's $30 million budgeted for communication upgrades and 10 million budgeted for distribution system devices. As we, as we modernize our communications network, we're doing so with both a fiber network as well as a wireless network. There are a variety of distribution system devices and as technology advances, more automation is available for our distribution systems. There's a variety of these devices and I'll speak to a couple examples of these towards the end of the presentation. Communication systems are not new to KUV. We've leveraged these over the, the last 50 plus years. We've leased cir circuits from providers such as AT&T. We've owned and maintained our own copper infrastructure and we've leveraged licensed frequency radio. We use a combination of these technologies to monitor and remotely control our operational systems. Some of those examples would be electric substations, gas regulator stations, water pump stations, and wastewater lift stations. As we install our fiber network, we're focusing on eliminating the recurring and rising costs of the lease circuits. We also are working towards eliminating our copper infrastructure. This infrastructure is aging, becoming more difficult to maintain and more expensive to maintain. Some of this cable is more than 50 years old. We also want to keep the future in mind. We realize more devices will be communicating more frequently and utilizing more data. So we want to make sure we have the future capacity needs capable to, to meet the future needs. Okay. Just a, an ignorance question. We're leasing circuits from third parties. What 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 is a circuit in this in this context? In this case, it's a four-wire copper circuit that's dedicated directly for our use. That's between our operation center and that remote remote asset. So typically, electric substations are where we mainly use those. And, and those we cost, lease them because it's cheaper for us to lease than it is to buy. It, it's typically where we don't have that infrastructure uh, out in the outlying sections of our service territory. So here's a map of the KUV service territory. All four utilities are represented here. The dots represent electric substations, and the green lines represent fiber that we've installed to date. The purple lines represent fiber planned for this fiscal year. You can see that we are beginning to, to have a nice fiber footprint across our service territory with currently around 100 miles of fiber installed. Also, this fiscal year is important because you can see in the southeast section of our service territory that we are connecting several substations with this missing link. Also, is everywhere that we have, we're putting in fiber, is there copper there now? In, some, in most cases, in, in probably about 60% of, of the cases there, there is. Uh, and the, the other 40% would represent those lease circuits. Mm -hmm. Can we sell the copper to offset the cost? Does it have any value when it's that, that old? It doesn't. It's, it's old and aging, so we'll, we'll actually remove that from our lines and increase some space for uh, additional attachments. So well, these if we leave it on the sidewalk, somebody will stand <laughs> there. <laughs> <That's very short. laughs> eliminate the, the cost of returning it to the, to the site, right? The, these seemingly random installations of fiber were actually where Century 2 work was being done, and we went ahead and installed fiber knowing we're going to need that in the future. So you can see at the end of our 10-year plan, around 300 miles of fiber, a lot of redundancy in this fiber network. So this will be a very reliable communications network for us in the future. So how long will this last? Once we do fiber, how long, how long will this last? This will be 
you know, we're expecting 30 to 50 years out of our fiber infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So is that part of, as we look at refresh, is that also part of okay. So a couple of statistics on our 10-year fiber installation. You can see we typically install between 15 and 20 miles of fiber per year. The next row represents the number of substations that will actually have connectivity through that fiber network. So now we'll be able to either eliminate a leak circuit or eliminate a copper infrastructure to, to that substation. Here you can see the lease circuits that we eliminate each year, and we eliminate the final one around FY22. So we save over two and a half million dollars cumulatively <coughs> across 10 years. Towards the end of the, the roadmap, you can see we've already eliminated all of our lease circuits, but we continue to see cost savings by, by not having those lease circuits. So I want to talk high level about our fiber installation process. We start with the design. We make sure that we meet all of our variables and all of our requirements for that fiber design. And then it may look odd to see testing so early in that process, but we actually test our fiber before we install it to make sure we're not installing cable that's been damaged during, during shipping. I'm going to talk more detail about testing in the next couple of slides. But then we have either KDV crews or contract crews install the fiber as designed. And what's important to note here is that it's typically installed in about 5,000 foot sections. So we'll typically see three to five sections between substations. Where these sections meet, we need to do something called fiber splicing. And that is where we actually create a seamless connection of the fiber optics to have communication to be able to transmit all the way through the different segments. How many fibers are in a bunch that you have to connect to? Yes. I'm going to get to more detail on that in just a moment, but there's 144, so wow. it's quite the intricate process, yeah. and that has to be done one, one by one. Yeah. So once splicing is complete, now we want to do that end-to-end -end test. Make sure that all the splicing was done correctly, no further damage was done. And then we terminate that, that cable at the end of, of each side. And basically this is just easy connectors for the equipment to plug into, so kind of that plug-and-play interface. And then we map, just like any other asset that we have, we need to know where the, those assets are, which fibers are in use, and which fibers are available for future use. And then finally, we just hook up the end equipment. So typically, this is some type of communicating device or protection, sub, uh, sorry, substation protection equipment that sends and receives data across, across this, this cable. So this is the tool that we use to, to test our fiber. It's an optical time domain reflectometer. It's a mouthful, so we just use OTDR instead of the full name. <laughs> so this tool allows us to quickly be able to measure and analyze the fiber to find any, any imperfections in that fiber. And a recent example of using this tool is a line was recently shot with a gun out in, in part of our territory, and this is not extensive damage. This is about the size of a dime. So imagine this cable 60, 70, 80 feet in the air. It's going to be hard to find that damage. So this tool actually pinpointed that damage to within three feet. So we're able to send the crew out and get that repaired efficiently. I'm going to speak a little bit to, to your question about how many fibers are, are in this, this cable that we use. So this is a, a multi-purpose cable that we actually use. And this hangs at the top of our 69 kV lines. The outer shield protects the lower, the lower ca uh, cables that are the electric conductors and pr provides the protection from lightning strikes. So it actually it is that protection ab above the other ones. Inside of that, there's 144 of these fiber optic strands that are the, the width of a human hair. So very delicate, and as we talk about splicing, it, you can understand the process. I'm going to pass this around so you can see a little more detail of those, of those fiber strands. But basically, as, as those strands are put together, they're put in this machine called a fusion splicing machine. And this is, this is a more detailed view of this machine, but basically these two electrodes, there's fiber on each direction right here, and the, the machine actually lines those up very precisely, and the electrodes create an arc and fuse the glass together. One so it basically time. melts it one at a time, 144 of those. So one thing I want to note here is this is currently done by by contractors, and we're going to bring this in house in the next few months. So we're bringing that skill set to KDB's workforce. Is there just curiosity where you link them together? Is there a loss of? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Sir, well, mm -hmm. yeah. Is it is there less right. information trans mm -hmm. transmitted on the back side? Right. Of so it's measured in, in dBs of loss. And this machine will actually do as well as 0.0, .0 
but typically we see about 0 0.02 of, of loss is, is like what we consider a good splice. So that, that's very minimal, two hundredths of a dB, and we can typically handle 10 to 15 dBs of loss um, between devices. So, so very minimal, but enough to show up on that OTDR machine so that we can say, okay, well, we know there's a splice case here. It's 50 feet past that, and we can say there, there's so an issue here. Show. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So this, imagine those 144 strands of fiber being fused together, it needs to be protected, protected and organized. So these are our splice case trays, and you can see that fiber routed around that tray, and that's where it's organized. This piece of the case is the protective case that actually encapsulates it and provides an airtight barrier from outside elements. So that's how we organize and protect our, our fiber. So I've talked a good bit about fiber. I want to transition to wireless for just a moment. Fiber is a great solution for a lot of what we do, but sometimes it's not the most efficient. Sometimes it can be expensive or timely to install fiber. So wireless can provide some of that last mile functionality to extend our fiber network out to some of these remote assets. It provides some flexibility to those changing assets as new assets are added or sometimes assets are moved. We've leveraged our existing vertical assets to minimize the cost of this infrastructure. And at the end of the day, wireless really just provides another tool to meet communication needs. So as a new requirement comes up, we can say, is fiber the best solution or does wireless make more sense? What's the downside of doing it wireless? It's, it, so, so wireless does, uh, does do better in the non-electric utilities. In some cases, Electric requires the speed of light communication, so across the fiber we have much faster speeds of communication. And wireless is, is kind of, it's still very fast, but it's kind of a step down from that. Is there a problem with data loss on wireless? Any type of data loss? There can be, but but the network that we're building is very robust and and resilient to to those types of situations. <laughs> So here's again a map of the KB surface territory, and you can see with a lot less infrastructure, we're touching a large amount of our surface territory. So the green lines represent links that have been installed, and the red links are links to be installed this fiscal year. So I've talked a lot about the communication networks. Now I want to talk about the how and the why of distribution automation. KB uses programs like vegetation management to improve reliability. We want to use technology and automation to, make, to take that next step of improving reliability. We also want to leverage technology to improve our efficiencies. So the more information we can have, the more accurate we can be with our operations crew, operational crews. And also we can remotely operate some of these devices, preventing truck rolls in some cases. So these are a couple of devices that we use. I'm going to go into more detail on both of these in the next few slides. But one thing I want to point out here is that these devices do require a more technical skill set than some of the previous manual devices. There's a communication aspect to this, as well as an artificial intelligence in these devices. So you'll continue to see KB's workforce continue to grow technically as these devices are installed. Faulted circuit indicators are a pretty simple device that basically communicate a more detailed location of an issue. So if a tree were to fall on a line, an alarm can come back and say more specifically where this fault may have, have occurred so that we can route our crews more efficiently to begin looking for that trouble. You may have seen similar devices in previous presentations. They're basically just a blinking light and the crews would have to find these <coughs> lights and traverse the trouble. These devices actually communicate back to the operation center so that we can direct those crews more accurately from the beginning. Recloser devices are devices that are constantly communicating with each other and can reconfigure the electric system. The next slides I have an example of how these work more in, in more detail, but they can also provide an, an alternative power source for our sensitive industrial customers. So here, here's a residential example of a couple of, of figures that we have. So you can picture these are, are just substations providing power to 1,500 customers each. So feeder A has these 1,500 customers, feeder B has these 1,500 customers. So each house represents 500 customers. This is what we refer to as a normal local point. This gives us the ability to reconfigure our electric system manually today. 
So in this case, a tree falls on the line. <coughs> it has the, the ability to impact a feeder or a breaker. And in this case, it's affected these 1,500 customers. So these customers are out of power until a crew comes out, makes the necessary repairs, and the power is restored. So the same, same configuration here, same residential area, but now we've added five devices. So these devices are all communicating with each other constantly, detecting any faults, and reconfiguring to minimize those faults. So again, each house represents 500 customers in this example, and everybody has their power on here. Same example where that tree falls in the same location, what you'll notice is immediately, because these are protective devices, I'm only impacting 1,000 customers at this point. And then within seconds of that tree falling, these devices are communicating with each other, determining if further action can reduce the, the impact of this outage. You can see that this device will open, and this device closes, restoring power to 1,500 or 500 customers. So within seconds, I'm only impacting 500 customers now versus 1,500. <coughs> So that's a lot about where we're headed, but there's a lot of work to do. So as we continue to, to focus on, on these efforts, we want to make sure that we eliminate the recurring and rising cost of the lease circuits, as well as the aging KV copper infrastructure. We want to increase the amount of automation on our system. And throughout distribution automation, we want to leverage technology and automation to improve efficiencies and increase reliability for our customers. Be glad to answer any other questions that they have. It's very interesting. I have a question for you. We we have read so much in the last couple of weeks about hacking, and um, how how are we um, able to keep our systems not in detail but in generally uh, secure from you know somebody mimicking some sort of a an outage or an event? Right. So we have multiple layers, and we also do annual assessments on that security to make sure that we are complying with all the best standards. But we, we do have multiple layers of security, and that the network that this sits on is, is very much separated from the other networks that we use at KDB. So it has those multiple layers of security. And I was going to ask about the training. So there are two sets of training and development requirements. Number one is to install this, right? So that will be brought in the house. And we're working with training our folks in terms of installing. What about the operational side of it? Are we doing additional training? What, what, what opportunity exists for, for growth in terms of the continual operation of this? Yeah, so as these devices come on, they, they are being trained to, to maintain and, and install these devices because there is that level of, of technical expertise. Right. So they are definitely being trained as we install these devices. And you have that house or? Yes. Question. Uh, so we're, we're Installing uh, fiber. This is this is really an internal system that we're that we're putting in. Um, is there going to be capacity with the fiber we're putting in, or potentially some external customers at some point down the line if we so chose, or is this something that is designed and installed to only be an internal system? So right now we are very much focusing on operations for KDB's right. um, assets and, and making sure that, that those requirements are met. Yeah, if there's available capacity in the future, I think those questions could, could come back up. But right now, we're, we don't have any plans to, to meet any of those requirements. So what percentage of the, I guess, the capacity would KDB be using for our internal purpose? It, it would be a fairly small percent. I would say like less than 20%. So at some point, if we so shows that we had, because one thing about fiber is it's very, it's very fast, it's very secure, it wouldn't be something that would necessarily be maybe a, a, a home type thing, but if we had certain uh, valued customers like the University of Tennessee that were needing a high capacity, secure, we could, that, that could be a possibility. It could be, this is great. I have a follow on question to that. So when these are purchased and bundled, if we're only using 20%, but you felt that 80% more was worth the purchase, or they just purchased in 104? There's a certain size, and there's a certain bundle, and that's just the way it is, so it's, you kind of pick. 
Well, and, and the delta cost is so minimal yeah. that we just wanted to have that capacity. Gotcha. Uh, I mean, you're talking pennies of, of delta cost. But last question. Um, hearing a lot about the uh, <coughs> risk of potential for EMP, electromagnetic <coughs> North Korea and others that develop these, these, these weapons. Um, and we're putting in, obviously, we're putting in lots of new circuits. Is there any, in those discussions, any thoughts about uh, hardened circuits? Are any of these hardened circuits that uh, would be an extra level of protection in the EMP? Or is it pretty much, it, it would be a complete system-wide risk and nothing we did on this level would affect it? That's a great question. I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that. So. <laughs> That's a good question. We'll have to check into that. That's a good question. Thank you all for the opportunity. Right. Yeah. I've got my bug out there, Greg. <laughs> so, Madam Chair, may I say something? Uh, I think this is the first time you've been before us, certainly since I joined the board. Congratulations. That Thank was you. a really good presentation. <laughs> So yeah. I'll just have to confess, it is his first time here, and so I sent him an email yesterday afternoon and I said, all right, Andrew, don't blow it. <laughs> I said, you have a bright future here if you don't blow it. <laughs> so I'll blow it. Of course I knew he would, so thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, commissioners, you hear a lot about our financial issues related to rates and bonds and cost management, but you've also heard us talk a lot about growth. Growth is an essential part of our financial plan. Um, you're going to hear a presentation today, and you're going to hear one next month. But today, we're going to talk to you about the natural growth that's occurring in our territory and the services that our new service department is providing to support that growth. And then uh, just a small little snippet about what you'll hear about in October. Thank you. John Williams is the president. Thank you. Um, supporting our customers' growth is central to our blueprint. Um, and we oftentimes present to the board updates on economic development projects and industrial customer developments like lifetime products, presenting these medical supplies. And today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about some good news in land development related to commercial and residential growth. Um, I'll talk a little bit about new service and how that department supports that growth. Uh, we'll also talk through uh, some individual projects and some areas of development. And then we'll end with a preview of the presentation to the board in October on our gas growth initiatives. One thing I want to start off with is, is, a, is a unique picture of, of the resurgence in, in housing development in the Knoxville area. Zillow, uh, a real estate uh, research company, um, recently uh, noted Knoxville uh, number seven in the nation in, in top markets. Now, certainly there's larger cities and, and larger markets out there, but on a per capita basis, we've seen a lot of, of housing and commercial development over, over the last few years. Uh, and it's interesting to see that on a national scale uh, it, it's also rising as well um, when, when you look at this map. And all this work um, that's coming into uh, our area right now in, in land development um, is coming through our new service department. And so I want to start with just a, a little bit of, of background as to how they get uh, their work and how they serve our customers in that particular area. There are three uh, distinct groups in new service noted in blue on the slide. Uh, I'll first talk about the building group. Um, they work with um, our residential uh, kind of single family, individual homes, small commercial customers. The, they'll help customers with anything from a private security lot um, to installing new utilities in a new home, uh, relocating utilities if needed, um, and or even working with the new restaurant that may be coming in. Those marketing representatives will meet with the customers on site, understand what needs they have, will work um, to draw up that job, give them cost estimates, uh, and then ultimately determine what, what due dates they need uh, and how we can get them uh, the service that they need. These are, there's another group, the land development group. They work with larger, more complex uh, developments, subdivisions, commercial developments. Uh, we'll talk a lot about some um, new mixed-use development. Uh, they spent time working on those. And they'll also support the folks in economic development, engineering, key accounts, and others on those industrial projects as well. Uh, this process has been in place for quite some time. Uh, the late 90s with the housing boom uh, caused KUB to, uh, to recognize that we needed a group that was more nimble uh, and ready to respond to that rapid pace of development. 
to be able to provide that, that one point of contact. And, and these, these processes and these groups have truly served us well um, over time. And in fact, uh, recently, uh, we reestablished a new service engineering group with the same purpose in mind of having some dedicated engineering staff that can respond to that rapid pace of development and be able to, to serve our customers need and get them uh, the work and the utility infrastructure in place when they need it, um, which is very, very important to them. In the end, all the work that comes through this group ends up with a workflow group. Um, their job is to make sure that those job packages are appropriately uh, organized, that they're accurate, the billing information is correct, the due dates are correct, and ultimately we get those to construction in order to meet those customers' needs. Um, this slide is, is simply uh, there to, to kind of give an indication of work volume. Uh, so basically the jobs that are coming through new service. Uh, not all of these jobs come to fruition, most of them do. Um, but when you look from 2011 until now, kind of coming out of that recession period, our low point in terms of just jobs work for new service is about 5,500. And that's steadily climbed. Uh, in 2016 is the calendar year, we had right at 8,100 jobs. So that, that steady growth is, is good, and we're happy to see that. Uh, so far, um, calendar year to date in 2017, we're getting close to 6,000 jobs uh, that we've received, and we're on pace with where we were in 2016. So that steady uh, growth is, is, is welcome. Um, for us. How that translates to actual customer count, um, as you recall, uh, fiscal year 17 marked our highest level of customer growth since 2008 with 4,400 customers. Uh, so while it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, they certainly correlate um, and a higher work coming through new service is, is good. Uh, it's good for customer growth. One thing that's interesting though is we've come out of the recession and, and are looking into this, this new uh, improved uh, land development activity. Some of the trends have changed. Um, when we look back into uh, the, uh, the housing boom of the 90s, there was a lot of, of, of land that was available in, in more rural areas, um, a lot of subdivisions going there. So a lot of the work that we had to do, uh, while it was high volume, was, was really straightforward. It was how do we extend our utilities to these new developments and work with the developers to meet their schedule. Um, today, those trends are, are, are changing. There's a new trend in, in urban revitalization. Um, a, a lot of customers are wanting to be more centrally located. Uh, there's a surge in multifamily um, developments like apartment complexes. Um, and, and so all those are, are, are causing um, but the way in which we do work and how we interact with our developers to change, which is fine. Um, a lot of times uh, these areas are, are being redeveloped, uh, such as areas like downtown in Cumberland, uh, where we're, we're going back in the same place something else was. So you've got tighter spaces to work in, Oftentimes, um, especially working in downtown and other areas, you've got an associated streetscapes project. So you're working with multiple parties and, and trying to coordinate all this work to best serve our customers and the project they're trying to, they're trying to establish. Um, so one of the places I wanted to kind of start to give a picture of some of these areas is, is, is downtown. Uh, just like Julie, uh, I flipped this map over so we could fit it on there appropriately so north is not top. Um, actually, uh, north is, is to the left of the screen. Uh, we have east up here with Hall of Fame Drive. Um, to the bottom of the screen is west with Henley Street, the Convention Center, and then south um, being the river there. A lot of projects going on over the last six years, and the color codes are just simply there to show the various stages of completion of these projects. But um, what I wanted to point out is there are over 100 uh, projects on this map in less than a square mile area. So a remarkable amount of work within the last six years uh, revitalizing downtown. So we, we see it every day driving around and walking around, but to see it on the map is, uh, is, is pretty impressive. So are, are we are we blocking yeah. off gay now? Is that no. Us or is that that's not us. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. That's not us. Good. That is not us. Yes. Um, so so we are here. Um, there's a few projects I do want to point out. Um, there's a new Marriott Hotel being constructed at the old Knoxville New Sentinel site, the corner of, corner of Church and State Street. I'm also going to talk about the old Baptist Hospital site, uh, the site of the new Riverwalk Apartments that's being constructed, as well as Regal's new corporate headquarters. Um, and we'll talk about those uh, in, in just a moment. I uh, also want to go uh, just to the west and, and talk just a moment about the University of Tennessee campus. Again, uh, a large amount of, of redevelopment and, and construction in that area. Uh, this map they shared with us is their 2016 campus master plan showing projects. Again, the colors are just various stages of completion. Um, over 60 projects on this map. Remarkable amount of work. Um, and, and just some, some key uh, Point, say they recently completed uh, Strong Hall, Stokely Residence Hall, um, Student Union uh, made a, a tremendous amount of progress uh, and should be completed in, in 2018. 
And then uh, kind of past, present, and future work on the west side of the campus is, is certainly a, a key area that they're developing as we move forward. So a lot, again, a lot of work um, on, on their campus as well. Moving just to the north, um, Cumberland Avenue. Um, a lot of work there. Uh, three years ago, four years ago, Cumberland Avenue looked much different than it does today. Uh, not only for the development itself, um, but the streetscapes project. I uh, know that was quite significant. Most of the projects on the list are, are complete, such as the standard, um, University Commons, expansion at, U at Children's Hospital. Um, and then there's a, some additional projects uh, that are current or proposed. But when this list is complete, uh, there'll be about 1,400 residential um, customers added, uh, several commercial customers. Uh, KV's investment in this list alone will be about a million dollars um, with an expected annual revenue of just over four million dollars a year. So a lot of work um, and, a, and a lot of growth going on in these areas. Um, I'd like to shift from talking about the areas um, to a few projects and since we're at Cumberland, we'll talk about one that's going on Cumberland, appropriately named the Cumberland. Um, so real quickly, just to orient you with where this is at, um, this is on the corner of 22nd Street in Cumberland. This is the East Tennessee Children's Hospital employee parking garage, railroad tracks at Volunteer Boulevard, and for those who might remember, there used to be an Exxon station here once upon a time. Fast forward to the summer of 2019, the Cumberland will be there instead. Um, this is a, a perfect example of, of the mixed-use development that we're beginning to see um, across uh, some of these more urban areas. Uh, on the bottom, uh, we know that, that one of several uh, commercial tenants will be the anchor, of, would be CVS. There'll be a parking garage as well, and then 215 residential multifamily units above that. Um, I do want to uh, also point out here, um, from, a, from a customer growth perspective, um, there, there's kind of two things going on here. One, you've got um, growth in terms of, of revenue and, and volume. Of, of energy consumed or water consumed, consumed, but it does vary a little bit from utility to utility in terms of absolute customers. For example, 215 residential units will have 215 electric meters, will have 215 new electric customers. The water will be master meter, so there will be one, one water meter to serve this facility, and that's, that's common for multifamily apartments. Um, so from an absolute customer growth, you'll see electric accelerate a little, a little bit more than, say, water in this particular perspective from, from an absolute customer count. All said and done, KV's investment um, when this is completed will be about $170,000 with an expected annual revenue of $450,000 uh, from, from this particular development. Uh, so customer growth is good. Next, we'll shift back to the Marriott. I mentioned that earlier. Um, again, corner of church uh, and state, uh, the side of the old uh, new Sentinel facility is here. Uh, fast forward, summer of 2018, Marriott, first dual brand Marriott in our area. They'll have both a courtyard and a residence inn. Um, there'll be 232 rooms in this facility. There'll be an on-site restaurant as well as uh, parking as well. So a great addition to the downtown area. <coughs> um, revitalization um, at, at, at work here. Katie's investment uh, right at $300,000 for this particular project um, with an expected annual revenue of $600,000. The last project that I'll, I'll walk through in, in detail um, is one just south of that across the river, the Old Baptist Hospital site. Uh, we've heard a lot um, about it being the future Regal headquarters, and they're certainly making a lot of progress in that, in that facility. But what I want to talk about is, is the Riverwalk uh, apartment. Um, it is a 313-unit residential complex um, built on the same site, a different developer, um, but same site. Uh, they're also uh, constructing a parking garage uh, for those apartments as well. And just behind there on Blunt Avenue is a streetscapes project as well. So a lot of a lot of people involved in a small site, uh, improving that area from a variety of perspectives. Um, when all this is completed, there will, there will also be a, a Riverwalk Greenway and an on-site public park. Um, so a, a, a really nice uh, end result uh, when this is completed. This is a, a current uh, current state construction. Actually, we took this picture yesterday. So um, this is this is pretty close to where it is right now. Um, there's also talk that there could be a phase two to the Riverwalk project just across the street, the corner of Blunt and, and Chapman Highway, uh, where there's talk about a, a new hotel as well as some retail space as well. So, so good news uh, on, on this front. Uh, again, 313 residential units. Um, Katie's investment to the apartment, uh, Riverwalk Apartments will be $250,000 with an expected annual revenue of $600,000. Um, so another good example.
Um, there, and there are many. Um, and, and this list is just, is just a few more um, that we felt like we needed to include because they, they are indeed notable. Uh, the Fort Data Center, uh, expected to open in April of, of 2018 on Summit Hill, uh, will we'll ramp up uh, between, between then and 2023 and, and is projected to become one of our top 10 electric customers. Regus Square, another mixed use development. Um, that'll, that'll house 102 residential and, and eight uh, commercial retail spaces as well. Um, that's scheduled to be completed in around the summer of 2019. Midway Business Park, we're currently extending wastewater and gas facilities uh, to serve that park. Our work should be done in May of 2018, and after that they'll have uh, some additional work to make that 350 acres available. And then as I kind of to end where I started um, with the housing side of things, um, the, the single family housing market is certainly growing um, as evidenced by 25 current developments. About 12 of those are on the west side of our service area. The rest are, are distributed between north, south, and east, west of our, of our service area. Certainly a lot going on with 760 uh, total lots. Um, so a lot of, of development centered uh, growth, uh, a lot of, of, of good revenue uh, coming in uh, for that. Um, and we continue to invest in that. If you recall back in April, uh, we shared with the board our plans to, to invest $80 million across the 10 years in customer growth. Um, that long-term uh, source of funding through growth allows us to have a long-term funding source for programs like Century 2. That, along with cost management, also allows us to have less reliance on both debt and rates as we move forward, um, which is very important. Now, up to this point, we've talked really about development-driven growth, which is good, and, and certainly that will always be um, the, the largest part of, of the growth that we see. But the board has also challenged us to find ways um, to grow our customer base. Um, so just wanted to provide just a quick preview of October's presentation uh, on customer growth, uh, gas growth in particular, um, and, and two uh, initiatives that we want uh, to share with the board that we, we would like to launch in November. The first being the inactive gas services. There are about 2,500 inactive gas services in our system. What that means is that there's a, there's a service line, a gas service line between the main and the home uh, that the customer's not using. They're not a gas customer, they don't have a meter. Um, and so we have, we have some maintenance activities associated with, with inspecting that and, and making sure uh, that that's in good shape. Um, and so rather than uh, capping that service, we want to provide an incentive uh, for customers to become a gas customer. And in this particular case, we're wanting to offer a free gas water heater, uh, free in installation and free removal of the old water heater, uh, no hassle to the customer whatsoever. We're hoping that this will be an appropriate incentive to get them to want to become a gas customer and at the same time avoid that cost of capping the service and provide them with an energy efficient uh, gas appliance. Um, we also hope that over time they may consider um, finding opportunities to, to switch over to other um, gas appliances. And speaking of that, we're going to also um, we also plan to unveil a, a rebate program for gas appliances as well for all gas customers. Um, and what this would do is provide the customer with a rebate incentive um, that would incent them to switch from an electric appliance to a natural gas appliance, such as a water heater or a range or a dryer <coughs> or whatever the case may be. It just yes, but in terms of gas, didn't we already cap a whole lot of folks? Because I remember those of us who weren't using gas, we, I thought we would cap them, and then if we wanted to then we um, activated, we have to pay a fee or pay a charge. I'm not sure of the, of the history of that. Um, I, I do know, depending on our maintenance activities, if there's, if there's a gas service that's not um, in, in good repair, then they may have capped those. Uh, I know currently, we, we looked to see what the current list was. Um, it's about 2,500, but I'll, I'll check on that. I'm not sure of the history of that. That's a good question. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure it makes sense, or we wouldn't be doing it. But if we if we convert an appliance from electric to gas, and we lose the electric sale. Yes, and, and yes and no. Um, you you also have. Uh, I mean, they still be using electric lights now, but but we they use less electricity uh, and they use gas that they haven't even used. Is it is it is, it, is the delta good? An incremental bottom bottom margin, but we view it as we're willing to give that up to get the gas customers. And the gas, margin's better on gas. Potential for uh, a new gas customer that is another utility's electric customer. Right? 
Well, that, that's part if it's space. if it's not in the city. I mean, if it's if it's somebody yeah. does that in the city in our service area, we're already providing them. That's right. That's right. But there is there is a segment of this where it would be, as Commissioner Askew said, that we would be giving up an incremental amount of electric margin yeah. to get the gas load. Yes, sir. Yeah. But keep in mind, gas is a um, typically a winter season fuel. If they use it for hair dryer or hot water heaters, then it becomes more of an all season fuel. Good. So it's to grow the load in seasons that it's not Good. utilized for. Good question. <clears throat> so, more to come in October. Um, and we'll have a full presentation detailing these <coughs> initiatives um, next month. Uh, I'd like to end um, with um, just a a nice and kind note that a customer had sent to us, uh, someone who had been remodeling their, their home, um, had some challenges, reached out to KUV, um, and we were able to help resolve those. Um, as, we, as we work through um, uh, you know, the, the increased volume of, of, of development and, and renovations and all those things, we have to keep our eye on the ball of customer service and keep that at the front of what we do. Uh, and this is just a good example I want to share with the board a you know, kind of validation of the hard work and the professionalism that our employees uh, provide to our customers each and every day. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Is it a true statement that gas is cleaner than, than electric? From, a, the environment, from an environmental perspective, yes. Um, and, and the easiest way to think about that is oftentimes electric will use natural gas in its generation. So it's inherently um, from an environmental perspective, uh, like for example, we were talking about CNG vehicles. There were studies done that those are from a cradle to grave one of the cleanest fuels uh, for, for vehicles. Even. Well, my point is just that that's a PR opportunity for us too. As we if we push the conversion, it yes, also sir. has the added benefit of being good for design. Yes, yes, on, on average, across the nation, you still have a decent amount of fossil fuel or coal that's used for the production of electric products. Right. John, I just want to say thank you and congratulations. This, <clears throat> being proactive on growth is, is I think it's just it's vital. Uh, and thank you for your team that's kind of come up with these concepts and it's taken them to fruition. I know it takes a lot of time and looking forward to the next presentation. But, you know, because development, we know, it, it comes and it goes. And, and so having a team that, you know, that can focus on being proactive, looking for ways to Thank you. And well, in the interest of sensitivity, Julie, we really liked your presentation. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. I have one more comment. I guess it, I, I wish I had written down all of the numbers when you said this. We invested $150,000 here, and our revenue, revenue is going to be $400,000. Do you have a number where you have the total investment of the projects and then the total revenue? I mean, I know you have some. We can somewhere. get that for you, absolutely. Yeah. We'd be glad to get that for you. Yeah. Is, it generally, is it generally on the order of the same, like, uh, three times, or, or I guess it probably it, it, it does vary. It, it, does, vary. Yeah. it does vary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Pretty dang good. Yeah. Yeah. If they are locating where we already have facilities, our investment is low. If they're locating miles away, then we have to invest more. Yeah. So, Many projects are more uh, economically profitable, so it's you know, a little profit uh, than others. But when when we're in these dense urban areas, um, it's very good for business. So the urban areas offset, of course, the other costs. Yeah. So yeah, I'd love, I'd love to see that. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> Commissioners, I'll start out with a compliment, and that is tomorrow we'll offer for the sale of the bonds. So yeah. you, don't, you don't have to give me more at the end. But we'll recognize <laughs> Commissioners, I am glad to, I guess, close out the uh, presentations today with good news. Um, you may recall the board did authorize us to sell $97 million in bonds back in May as part of funding this year's utility system capital budget. After the board approved it, we took it to city council in mid-July, and they authorized it as well, and we sold bonds just late last month. Um, and uh, we actually sold through public competitive sale. That is our process, our standard how we, we sell bonds here. Um, we didn't receive it quite as much interest or as bids on the bonds as we have in recent years, but uh, we did receive very good rates, uh, much uh, lower rates than I was expecting actually on the date of the sale. 
and compared to what we budgeted when we put the, uh, the bonds into our plan back in the spring, we budgeted an interest rate of 3.75%. And as you can see, the bonds actually sold much less than that, ranging from a low of 305 <coughs> to a high of 309, so a relatively tight range. Uh, but compared to what we budgeted, we obviously are going to achieve some savings throughout over the life of the bonds, which are 30 years, we'll have $14 million in less debt service payments, which is a big deal. And then over the course of the 10-year plan itself, a little bit shorter time frame, about $7 million in savings. So that's $7 million that you know, basically our customers won't have to pay when, when it's all said and done. So that's a good thing. Also to point out that our high quality bond ratings from Moody's and Standard & Poor's were reaffirmed or affirmed as part of the issuance process <coughs> as well. So that's all good news. Now I've got eight more charts here that are actually nine that I'm required to show you in accordance with our debt management policy. There's two for each system. I'll try and go through them fairly quickly. So be careful what you approve in policies. <laughs> it can lead to long presentations. Um, on our electric bonds, we received a total of eight bids, and which is pretty typical for what we've seen on electric in the past couple of years. The low cost bids were Hilltop Security at 3.08%, uh, so roughly 3.08%. Um, Hilltop is not a name that I actually recognized, and so I researched it a bit. It's the former Southwest Securities, if you know that name. Southwest Securities actually have bid on our bonds over the years and actually um, was low-cost bidder on a couple of series uh, over the past few years, but it is now Hilltop, and they did get awarded the electric bonds. Just looking at it from an electric system perspective, 3.08 versus 3.75, what we budgeted, electric system, about $6 million in savings over the last of Looking at our total electric bond profile, what we have outstanding, including the new issue, we now have 306 million in outstanding electric division debt that matures over a period of 30 years. Now about 46% of that, or 141 million, will be retired over the next 10 years in accordance with this long-term schedule here. Um, do want to point out the interest cost associated with that is $133 million that's equivalent to an average rate of around 3.6% on the total electric debt. For the gas bonds, a total of six bids. Raymond James was the low-cost bidder at 3.085%. And for the gas system, that equates to savings of about $2 million over the life of the bonds. Total gas division debt over the next 30 years to be repaid is $119 million. That equates to a debt ratio of 35% for the gas system. About 57% of that, or $68 million, will be paid off in the next 10 years. For the water bonds, a total of five bids. Um, so 3.05% was a low-cost bid, and that went to Morgan Stanley. Water system savings over the life of the bonds is around $3 million. For the total water outstanding debt is now $185 million over the next 30 years. That equates to a system debt ratio of 50%. Interest cost on that is $91 million, and the weighted average cost is 3.54%. And last but not least, for wastewater, the $25 million wastewater bond <coughs> received five bids as well. Low cost bid 3.09 from Raymond James. So Raymond James was uh, awarded two series of the bonds, the gas and the wastewater. And for wastewater in total, we now have $525 million in outstanding wastewater debt. That's a system debt ratio of 63%. And of course, we've talked to the board and shown you a plan that we intend to bring that down over time. The interest cost, $307 million. Um, because wastewater was spread over a longer period of time during the course when we were issuing bonds for Century 2, only 27% is due to be repaid over the next 10 years. Our debt management policy that the board has approved requires at least 20% to be paid over the coming 10 years. So we do are in compliance with that. And then just to close out, last slide I have is just to review for you the professional fees uh, associated with the issuance of the $97 million in bonds. And you can see it listed by the various firms that were involved in the issuance process, including Moody's and Standard & Poor's for their ratings. Total $507,000, that's about one half of 1% of the par value of the bonds, which has been historically consistent with what, what we've um, paid as a percentage of the 
par value. Um, I'll point out that the fees paid to Cumberland and Bass Ferry and Sims are established in terms of contracts that we have in place with both of those firms. And then Moody's and S&P sort of charges what they feel is appropriate. And um, <laughs> then you see Regis did some other miscellaneous costs. Well. So, um, that's all I have. I'll just, uh, well, one other thing, and I always must forget this. In front of Chair Herbert is the bound official statement of the bonds, which has all the details that you would like to know about it. Um, it is available. We'll be glad to bring it to your homes or place of business if you wish to have a very large paperweight in your home or something such as that. But we are required also by state law to make it available in an open public meeting for either the board or the public to, to review it. So, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We, uh, this, again, I can't remember. I've been on the board for a year and a half. Do we borrow money to flood bond every year? Uh, yes. In some systems. In one system over there? Yes. Gas is the only one that we're really in a pattern of every two to three years, but the water, wastewater, and all <coughs> we're in a pattern of doing it every year. My so. point is the graph show where we'll be, we'll be paid off, we'll be paid off on what we have now, but That's next right. year we'll be adding some You'll more. We'll be layering some more on there. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's right. That is correct. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Um, next, we have the nominating committee report from Commissioner Thompson. The nominating committee received 16 applications for the term beginning in January. Um, the nominating committee has reviewed the applications and will conduct interview later this month. Interviews later this month, pursuant of the city charter, at least five candidates will be submitted to the mayor and will be nominated and will nominate those candidates at next month's meeting. All right, do we have any other business or comments from the commissioners? Uh, I know we have a visitor here today. Um, would you like to uh, address the commissioners? Sure. And uh, if you would, I don't want, I can't hardly read your handwriting, sir, if you would just uh, introduce yourself. And there's a five minute limit on your remarks. My name is John Vincenzo. Um, first of all, I found a meeting industry interesting. I was uh, kind of complaining to myself that you made your customer wait to the last moment, but it is very informative. I did find that you made more of a profit margin than I was let on. Just a uh, just a note. I received the bill. I bought twenty-five dollars of your service. I was charged ninety dollars. I bought no water, just bought some electricity in my house that I'm working on. 75% of my bill is your fees. You call them basic fees. I don't know how basic they are, but they're kind of eating up your customer. You made mention of uh, converting the gas. I won't convert the gas. I'd like to. I've used gas most of my life. Why would I? You're going to charge me another fee. I conserve energy, my wife and I both, we conserve water, I can charge the same fee. Doesn't make a lot of sense to the customer. I guess I, I'd like an explanation of what this basic fee is and why you feel 75% of my bill is proper. How, I, I think the first thing that popped into my head is how much of your total sales is basic fees? It can't be 75%. Why am I being charged so much when I don't use, when I didn't use your product? Uh, if Walmart were the only shop in town, and I decided to go on vacation in a month, and they sent me a bill anyway, I probably wouldn't pay it. I paid your bill. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, there's uh, someone here from the staff uh, that will be uh, discussing uh, that with you, and we appreciate well, we, your we already had a discussion, and she kind of said the same thing I got from your billing department. Now, I'm here because I was told I have to be here before I go to the Utility Commission to try and explain how you can justify a fee, a basic fee. Basic fee to me is basic care. 
I mean, I think you just heard about all the investments that we make in order that you can I, plug in and turn that switch. I understand, and I think that's wonderful. But you're getting, you're investing two hundred and fifty thousand and getting a monthly, or yearly. I'm sorry, of six hundred thousand. That's not what I was led to believe when I spoke to your billing department. That's it. Thank you very much. You're Anyone else here that wants to address the commissioners? Before we adjourn, I want to share some good news. Um, I was pleased to attend um, the YWCA Tribute to Women last Thursday night. And um, we had reported that Leslie Hartzell was a nominee. And uh, she was the winner in the business and professional leadership category. And, and a lot of people don't really realize this. But there is an out-of-town panel. That, that judges this. So this isn't some, you know, slap your buddy on the back type award. Um, somebody else is, is, is judging these things and uh, was very proud that, that Leslie was the winner. But the other proud moment I think that um, we experienced last Thursday night was Nikisha had won that same award last year and she got to present the award to Leslie. And so it was, um, doubly sweet uh, for both of them to be uh, uh, recognized and we're so pleased with what both of you uh, do here at, at KUB and make us uh, very, very proud. Thanks. Snaps. Thank okay, following the adjournment of this meeting, the board and staff will have a lunch session across the hall that is open to the public and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.